Well, thank you for having me. Um, waiting for them to switch over. Oh, there we go. Um, that was the uh, Google Doodle we did for Oman, uh, Omani National Day. This was back in 2015 when we ran this. Do we keep the music running? Or, uh, the music? I don't think you want me to dance. Just, you know. Uh, anyways, <laughs> let's get started. Um, so, I have a bit of dusty history that I, I like to give uh, when talking about uh, open source software and free software. So, uh, the Free Software Foundation, which many of us are familiar with, they had a, a very important piece of software. Uh, and it wasn't Emacs uh, or Herd, it was uh, GCC, the GNU compiler collection. And unbeknownst to Richard and, and other Free Software Foundation folks at the time, GCC would end up being probably one of the most important pieces of free software ever written, um, especially with regards to hardware and software development. Um, and if you look at governments all over the world, um, what you really noticed happening is as people were adopting Unix and even uh, alternative operating systems like the Wang via, uh, VMS, you, you saw people buying these incredible workstations at the time and they were very, very expensive and the first thing they would do is they would cut a small check to the Free Software Foundation for a tape, uh, literally a tape, uh, or an eight track of uh, the GNU compiler collection and Emacs. And this is how things were in computing for a very, very long time. And if you were a contractor building a whatever for a government, um, whether it was a military system or, or any other sort of commercial system, you would usually start by developing something on top of Unix using GCC. Um, chip vendors, when they were making a new chip, they would always make a new back end for the compiler so that you could target that chip. And this is literally how it was until about two or three years ago as chip vendors started using LLVM more often. Um, its importance really can't be stressed highly enough. Um, I'll skip this slide. Um, and the thing about open source and the internet, a lot of things actually didn't happen in open source the way that we thought that they would. Uh, if you look at uh, the early 90s, we had proprietary desktops, we had uh, Unix systems often on the back end of these things. Um, but there wasn't a huge demand for what we considered open source at the time. Um, and then the internet happened. And the internet was very popular, as you might imagine. Um, and so commercial organizations, governments, and the rest, they would go to their providers at Microsoft and Sun and Oracle and all the rest, and they would say, hey, IBM, I, I really want to offer a website. And IBM's like, well, let's do an engagement. And, and, and they would often go down these very, very complicated paths. Meanwhile, people are like, or I could just download Apache, and I could ship a website in no time. I could learn from other websites by looking at their source on how to hack together some HTML. I could feed it using Apache, uh, then running only on Unix, and then on Linux, it was even easier. I could download Linux, install it on a common workstation, uh, a PC, make sure Apache's on there, boom, I'm serving web content. And so open source, in a lot of ways, uh, became popular with the internet, and the internet became popular with open source. And they were literally inseparable. Um, uh, frankly, most commercial organizations, they approached the internet very carefully, or they tried to cram it inside their model of how to sell software. Um, Microsoft famously, uh, when they first developed the internet information server, which was their web server, um, they tried to charge client access licenses for everyone who might access it remotely. So everyone who comes to the website needs to have a hundred or two hundred or three hundred dollar client access license to use that website, which was of course ridiculous. And when people are like, or oh, I'll download this free thing and just ship. Um, and as that happened, that's when Google became possible too. But this isn't really about Google, but it is about a fair internet and what it meant when anyone can put up a site. Uh, anyone could access that site with the same tools. Um, we, we rapidly realized that having open source implementations made for a more competitive market. Um, uh, the previous speaker um, uh, mentioned this quite a bit, 
and it wasn't even the commodification of software or a loss of value to software. But what we found was that in areas where there were open source competition, um, along with proprietary software, you started having people competing with functionality for the customer. And, and that was really, really important. And in fact, I, I came to believe that if you had free software being offered alongside proprietary software, and if you were, you were lucky enough to have multiple implementations of free software and of proprietary software in the same space, this was an ideal situation for the consumer, the developer, who might use this software. And so we tried to aim for that in our, in our, in our work at Google. Uh, you know, example of this, you know, I have both examples and counterexamples. So if you look at the DNS, there's really no proprietary DNS software market. It's completely done uh, by open source software. Even if uh, you wanted to run the .om top level domain, there's open source software to do that. You, there's never any reason to use a commercial uh, piece of software for doing this. In fact, the last commercial software that did DNS probably went out of business 12 years ago. Uh, in the web serving market, there aren't any proprietary uh, offerings that aren't free, um, like ISS and the rest. Um, you could probably find Oracle, you could probably pay them if you really wanted to to do web serving, but nobody really does that. In the browser space, which we consider very, very important, um, you have both commercial and open source software licensed uh, projects, uh, whether it's Chrome and Chromium or Safari or, uh, or Microsoft's Edge product or Firefox, you have basically running the gamut of licensing choices. And I think that's resulted in an extremely competitive market for high performance browsers. Um, I could go on. What's funny is where this doesn't work. Um, and, and where it doesn't work is when people have um, rejected standards in the face of market pressures. So in, in social networking and identity, people tend to shut down uh, connectivity to open source efforts because they see it as a way for their competitors to steal their customers. In instant messaging, you see this too. Instant messaging, we used to think that we could do with Jabber and XMPP what we had done with email and with browsers. But the growth of Facebook Instant Messenger, WhatsApp, and the rest has belied that. So unfortunately, I think that in, in the cases of IM and social, we are stuck in a world that is extremely proprietary and controlling. Um, and I don't think that's good for us. So we'll see where that ends up going. But when we are in a position where we have strong commercial competitors and strong open source competitors, I think that's what serves the consumers worldwide the best. Um, and and if, if that consumer, since this talk is ostensibly about government use of, of free software and incentivization therein, it's really important to realize that governments are in a very special position when it comes to data and when it comes to software. Um, the sovereignty of a country shouldn't be outsourced to a company in Mountain View or, or in uh, Seattle or in other places. Um, the importance of open source software is a way of governments who don't have the ability to uh, just write their own operating systems, write their own databases, write their own services is paramount. And it is one of the few ways I think that we can preserve uh, frankly, the sovereignty of governments and, and around data. And, and let me tell you a terrible story uh, from California, uh, which is where I live. There's a county in California that is not, frankly, uh, a very rich county. It's, it would be considered very poor and very rural. Um, and in this county, it's uh, Calaveras County, um, they, for a very long time, had the ability, you would be able to go on their website, you would be able to see the entire map of the county, and, and pay your taxes and all the things that you want to do with the government, especially around real estate. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, they're like, we can no longer offer this if you would like to see these assessor maps. You can come to our offices in Calaveras County and look at the books, because we all had these books for doing this. Um, and the reason was, was they had a contract with a very large geospatial firm in the States, which I won't mention their name, and they were not able to take their data out of that contract. They hadn't planned accordingly. And so when they, they wanted to implement their own system uh, using Google Maps but also being open to OSM, they were unable to do so. And so they had to literally start from scratch, revert back to their paper uh, maps. And it was, in my mind, a shining example of why you 
don't want to be locked into a given vendor. Because it's not just locking in for the future competition of that contract, which is bad enough. It was also the ability to take data that really belonged to the state, belonged to the, 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 the sovereign in charge, um, and they were unable to, to get it out. And so they were forced to just stop offering that. And then uh, I anticipate someday they will re-offer it, but they probably won't do it with that vendor or in that manner. Um, and this sort of thing actually happens quite a bit, especially in the United States, where we become dependent on our vendors, uh, both to host the data, um, uh, but also to do further software development and advances on that data. Um, as the government had never adopted uh, proprietary compilers in the development of you know, weapon systems and hardware for the military, um, certain proprietary vendors at the time, notably Microsoft, were extremely upset that they could not crack that market. Uh, they complained there was a congressional investigation and so the Department of Defense famously in 2002 uh, funded a company called MITRE to do a study of open source use in the United States government. And what they found was that if they were to shut down the use of open source software, especially GCC, especially the compiler tools and the rest, they found that they were going to have to ground uh, about 90% of the fleet, uh, bring those boats back in and rewrite from scratch. And that of course was not going to happen. And it was even deeper than that. So what came out of this investigation was really fascinating. They were like, what we need is not um, a rejection of open source, but an acknowledgement of it and, and to continue to support it. Now what's funny about this is the Navy had been one of the first backers of a company called Cygnus, which worked on the GNU compiler collection. Uh, it was purchased by Red Hat. Uh, there's a Red Hat person here in the conference. Uh, it was purchased by Red Hat, uh, in, or I think it was around 2000 or 1999. And and they continued that relationship with the U.S. military to improve this tool really for the whole world, but especially because we depended on it so much as a, as a government. So governments and, and open source code really go together uh, like peas and carrots. They go together like uh, rice and meat. You know, it's, it's, it's incredibly important. And, and from what I could tell from the earlier speeches uh, from our, our honored guests, that y it's a mission you've already adopted. And, uh, and I want to herald you for that. That's, it's remarkable. Um, and I would say, let's go to the next step and, and think not just about the open source software that is available, but think about the open data that is available, um, both produced by governments, but also consumable by, by them. In the United States, we have code.gov, and we have this concept that when, when the US government writes code, if I were a U.S. government worker and I were to write a piece of code, it is not by default copyright me. It is actually entered into the public domain for the U.S. citizens to use. Um, the problem is it doesn't actually happen that way uh, when you use a contractor. Um, so what we saw were the rise of laws that said, yes, the U.S. government can pay you for your software, but that software can be kept exclusively proprietary to that company. Um, and the government maybe has a right to use it. And so what we encouraged governments worldwide to do um, uh, from inside the open source software community, of which I've been a member for 20 years, uh, much like our, our last guest, um, is we told them, listen, the important thing about open source software is not that it's actually open source or that it encourages open data, but what it really means when you're valuing software. So uh, if you were to go and speak to a vendor of software and the contract does not give you rights to that code or the rights to get that data out, that is a huge cost to the sovereign nation. Um, and it's one that should be reflected during procurement. So what we encourage people to do is say, listen, there is a cost to being locked in. Prices go up very, very quickly and, and you can't get out. So put in provisions that require the exportation of data from these systems and see what that changes, how that changes the contract. Put it in recognition of what having the source code does for the government when it comes to recompeting that contract when you consider the value of that solution. And, and that saw some success, mostly in Europe, less so in the United States, although we had some uh, traction here and there. Um, we had some advances in Egypt as well, but we were shut down. This is pre-revolutionary Egypt. Um, Post-revolution Egypt was a lot more amenable to this. Um, and we can talk about that off the record. Uh, <laughs> so um, 
it's funny. Uh, I hear people protest about this. Uh, they say, well, you know, we have a really good relationship with our proprietary software vendors. Um, and that's sometimes true. Um, but what I find is more satisfying for countries when I speak with them is when that proprietary software vendor is an Omani company, then they're, they're right on board. And I would say, focus on the data so you don't become beholden to these these companies too. Just be careful when doing procurement. Um, but it's actually very, very difficult to build a domestic software industry, um, period, uh, open source or proprietary. So I would only say what you're doing so far looks like it's, it's a pretty remarkable effort and keep it up. Um, in the United States, we, we had um, some really interesting successes um, in, in various projects. So um, back in 2000, Eight during uh, the first campaign uh, when Obama was running for president, um, we really wanted to help uh, Americans find out where to vote. And so we went to the incredible number of counties, which is how voting is done in the United States. Counties are basically the districts that run the polling locations for the voting. And some of them refused to give us data. Some of them gave us printouts. And some of them gave us just, you know, you know, information on CD-ROM. And so we had a little army of Googlers, uh, my colleagues, we call ourselves Googlers, um, going through these things and hand entering them into the system so that people would know where to vote. And because one of the biggest queries we get during elections is where do I vote? And then um, we had a lot of people very, very upset with us because it turns out there were a number of companies who sold polling location information to the campaigns. And as an American, I felt that was kind of offensive. So. Um, this software, uh, we, we wanted to release the data. The reality was the Voter Information Project at the time, VIP, um, was uh, very ill-formed as a standard. It didn't make a lot of sense. It, it was terrible to implement. So what we did is we basically implemented our own version of the Voter Information Project and released that uh, under uh, Creative Commons Public Domain, I believe, at the time. And that had a, a wonderful side effect that we had seen before at Google. When you have a valuable data set and you release it under an open format, even if you're not specifically right on the money with that open format, your version becomes the open format. And so uh, VIP was broadly adopted throughout the European Union. Uh, we saw it being used in Turkey, uh, Egypt, and Tunis. And Google wasn't the only company consuming uh, VIP files at this point. It was all the search engines. All the municipalities were now demanding that when they create these systems with their contractors that they publish information in VIP format. Uh, your consultative assembly, I'd imagine, has someone inside it who's like, well, for the voting, we should probably publish the information this way. Uh, we did this in India. We did this everywhere. And it's, and it's very satisfying to see an open standard take hold like that. We saw it with schema.org as well as with sitemaps as well. Um, and it's a great way of getting government information into the hands of, of the citizens of that country. So what's funny is in the United States, a lot of people I think have this picture that, wow, you can figure out where a bus is, you can figure out where a rail is. It, it's almost never true in, in the bigger cities like New York and San Francisco because the infrastructure is so poorly maintained. Um, but in Portland, Oregon, in 2006, I believe, they put up a website that could show you where every bus was so you would know when you would be able to get on a bus, uh, which in Portland is a good thing because their buses run terribly. Um, and so we had a, a Portlandite uh, in our group, and he said, I really want to publish this as a transit standard. And there weren't a lot of really good transit standards. So um, we just published it, and we, we would scrape the Portland website. And at first they didn't like us for doing that. And then they said, OK, you can do that. Um, and, that and that became this great format that is now used throughout the world uh, for denoting when trains run, when buses run, where they go, and, and all the rest. And, and we've seen a huge amount of opportunities, especially in the, in the geospatial standards around this. I, I don't want to talk about geospatial too much. We have a speaker from OpenStreetMaps who might be in the room. I don't know. But um, th they can talk about this a lot. Um, I would only say with an Oman, I'd imagine you have a ministry who cares deeply about mapping, especially around the, the oil plots in the country. Um, 
I, I visited the PDO museum yesterday. And it's, it's very clear that this is the sort of thing that's very, very important. So I, I'll, I'll let the OSM person talk, though. It's not really my place to do that. Um, so um, yeah, so here's, here's the part of the talk that I really wanted to give today. And, uh, and, and the last two slides are my favorite and probably the ones I'm least practiced giving. But I, I think that Oman has an opportunity beyond open source, beyond um, uh, open data, that I think you have a chance as a country with your computer science programs, with your dedication from, uh, from your sultan uh, to have, I think it was 80% of all of the government's work being written by or, or done by Omani nationals. Um, I think you have an opportunity to actually leapfrog a lot of uh, uh, your fellow governments and your, your fellow countries uh, beyond where computer science is today in the States, in Europe, and, and go straight laser focused into machine learning. Um, and I'll get there, but it's really important, so I, I'll get there fast. So I'm going to burn through some of these slides so I can talk a lot about those. I have to watch my time, I think. Um, so. Google uses open source for the same reason that governments use open source. We want to control our own destiny, right? Google is much smaller than the nation of Oman. We are much smaller than the population in Oman who would be programming. But we were able to leverage the work of over 10,000 engineers for 10 years in our methods of adopting open source software. In that, Oman has all the opportunities um, of, you know, an entire Silicon Valley's worth of developers just waiting for you to use it. And it seems that you've already embraced this idea. So I'm not going to talk about it too much and how cool it is. Um, but when you take open source into your country, you are controlling your destiny. And that is what matters um, about open source. Uh, and it's funny because when you look at why we created Android and why we created Chrome, it was literally because we saw a barrier between us and our users at Google. When we looked at in 2004, 2005, uh, which is when we actually acquired uh, Android. The smartphone market, it was very, very stark. At the time, it was mostly Symbian who were able to provide a, a web browser onto the internet. And if we wanted to have presence on a Symbian device and the ability for Symbian users to reach Google, we had to pay Nokia, the carriers, and everybody. And we're like, wow, so they're going to keep us from talking to our users, right? Um, they're going to get between us. They're, they're going to control our destiny, and we're not going to be able to do that. It, it would be as if you didn't have PDO running your own oil markets. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's basically you are, uh, you know, a citizen of those other companies. Um, so we knew that we had to develop a mobile operating system so that people could have a great way of accessing the free and open internet and get to us. Um, and it wasn't that we didn't know that the iPhone was coming. We did. Um, but we didn't anticipate them being all that open unless they had a competitor. And we come back to that idea that with competition from open implementations, we are able to serve the consumers better. And the citizens of the world are able to reach those things that matter to them. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to make the phone market more like the internet. So that's why we did Android. I mean, it's really very simple. Uh, the same thing is true of Chromium. Browsers uh, at the time were, they were sort of in trouble. Um, internet Explorer was maintaining its, its majority share. Um, they didn't like us very much at Microsoft. And um, Firefox was doing well, but they didn't want to accept certain patches from us around safety, security, and performance. Uh, it's not to say that Firefox is bad, it's a fantastic browser, um, but we needed more. And so that's why we launched Chrome and its open source component, which is Chromium, and people were using it aggressively. Um, all the way down to, this is why we released Chrome OS. We needed a very secure operating system that we could not control, but uh, in the case of Chromium, we just open source it and anyone can use it. But we can keep it deterministic and a secure environment because we think one of the things that drives people away from the internet, away from websites, and onto these closed applications and networks is a fear, a legitimate fear uh, of being insecure on the internet. Uh, and I'm sure that our security speakers will speak about this. I've got to keep it tight. Uh, I've only got about seven minutes left. Oh, so TensorFlow and deep learning. So this is where I think Oman should go, OK? Um, one of our, our most esteemed developers uh, and leaders at Google, his name's Jeff Teen, he said, if I were writing Google today, and this is a person who literally helped write 
vast amounts of what you think of as being Google. Um, he said, if I were writing Google today, I would not write a single thing using the heuristics of the past. I would use deep learning networks and convolutional learning neural networks to do it. And what he's done over the last three years with TensorFlow inside Google, it was formerly called the Google Brain Team, because we like our names. Um, is he's gone through the company and we've been replacing things right and left with neural network implementations. So whenever you're doing a search on Google, you're using TensorFlow, you're using Google Brain, and you're using a vast amount of computation resources, but that's okay. Um, when I think of the computational needs of uh, a government, of a nation, I just think of how many ways we could apply TensorFlow, how we could apply machine learning to making government services better, um, you know, geospatial services, all of your ministries, it's like you could point at a ministry and I'll tell you five ways they can use neural networks to become more efficient and more effective and, and more powerful, really. So uh, we open sourced TensorFlow a, a little over, I think it was a year ago now, and it's become one of the most popular projects we've ever released. And I released Go, I released Android, I released Chromium. TensorFlow is probably the most important release I've done in my career. And I, w I would encourage you to take a look at it. It is worth your time as computer scientists, as engineers and entrepreneurs. It's, it's sort of a, a joke around Google is like, oh, well, you know, I'll just add machine learning to this. I'll just dollop on this machine learning sauce. But it's actually really true. When you bring the right kind of learning and you really look at the computation you're doing, um, you can do amazing things with the right resources directed at machine learning. So uh, just give me an idea. We're using it literally all over the company uh, within our biotech uh, co-alphabet entities, Verily and Calico, they're using it for drug discovery. We're using it uh, in our, uh, you know, our, our translation system is now fully based on, on, on deep learning networks as opposed to the former statistical models we were using. We use it for image understanding. If you use Google's photos, it's one way of seeing it, but we actually make this available via our cloud machine learning uh, systems where you can just say, what is this symbol? What is this picture? What's going on inside this thing? Um, it, it's literally throughout the company now. Uh, it, even uh, products that are dead like uh, Google Glass, we used to use it for recognizing blinking uh, within the user interface so that it wouldn't do it. And, and we were able to do that using an incredibly small amount of power uh, on the device. So this is an incredible realm for computer science. And, and I would say it's really tempting as a nation to say we're just going to concentrate on what's current um, in, in open source software and in the rest. This is an area that is going to be cracked wide open over the next five to ten years. And Oman should be there. Uh, this is just a silly thing. But basically, what is this picture? Is this a cat or a dog? Uh, it's a dog, by the way, I think, uh, sleeping inside a, uh, a laundry basket, right? And you could think the other one's a cat. Or maybe it's a dog. Maybe it's underpants. I don't know. Um, the long short of it is, these networks are now good enough to be able to recognize these things. And, and they go beyond it. We have a, a, a training set that when it looks at this image, it'll say, there's a laundry basket, there's clothes, they're probably dirty, there's a dog inexplicably sleeping on top of the clothes. And it's probably a whatever the, the breed of dog that is. It's better than I am at recognizing dog breeds. Um, and that's just the visual aspect of TensorFlow. Um, the, the other releases that we've done, they're great too, but I mean, seriously, take a nice hard look at TensorFlow. I think I've only got about four minutes left. Um, we've uh, put a lot of software up on GitHub. Uh, last year alone, uh, Googlers uh, contributed 250,000 patches uh, throughout uh, GitHub. You can find a lot of our software there. Um, We've retired probably more projects than most companies have ever released, but you can find a lot of them there. Uh, I would stress that there are some things that I think that um, a government use is uh, probably better targeted than others, and I, I've listed them here. Uh, MLab is just a profile of how people provide bandwidth uh, throughout the world, so you can get an idea of where you sit in the global stage when it comes to providing bandwidth to your citizens. Um, Gennetti is actually being retired, but it, it's been replaced almost completely by Kubernetes for systems management. Um, Omaha is a web updating technology. It says compression. It does that sort of thing for software updates. Uh, WebRTC is for video conferencing and chat. 
Um, and the geographical databases uh, for the white spaces project in the states I think is directly applicable here in Oman if you wanted to go in the direction of providing uh, high speed internet bandwidth wirelessly in the, in the UHF spectrum. Um, so the geographical database it's readily applicable. Uh, you would bring your state maps into that and give you a very good idea of how you would want to do everything from antenna placement to uh, bandwidth provisioning. So that's the long and short of it. I, I don't want to take too much time away from my, my other speakers. And that would be it. So thank you for having me uh, here in your wonderful country. So.